for the compliance uh, recruiting boot camp second portion. So um, we're going to get started this morning. So just some general compliance reminders to uh, start off the, the week before we start practice. Um, do not practice any student athletes until they appear cleared on a memo, i.e. email, from the compliance office. I will send you an email before Thursday morning with all of the student athletes that are cleared to begin practice. Do not add a student athlete to your roster without coordinating with compliance and athletic training. Um, whether this be a walk-on or an enrolled student tryout, we have forms for all of that. So please fill out the appropriate form and uh, cite it through my office. And again, um, I will send an email once they are cleared to begin participation. Please notify my office of any changes to your roster. David mentioned this uh, last week. We have forms for roster additions, deletion, voluntary termination of scholarship. Um, those are all on box. Um, and most of you should have already completed this, but the declaration of playing and practice season form, I emailed that out to all head coaches this week. That needs to be completed before Thursday. Um, that just puts down when your first date of con uh, practice, competition for each segment are. That needs to be de declared at the start of each year. If any changes occur, you can either submit a new form or we can just doctor up the one already on file in my office. So the start date for out-of-season accountable uh, activity for non-fall sports for um, the rest of you uh, will be Thursday the 25th. So every year it's either September 7th or the fourth day of classes. Every office is manned with a compliance procedures manual. This is something that I compiled a few years ago. So as with everything, uh, policies and procedures change. Uh, but overall, it's a great resource for how we do things. Um, if you don't know where that binder is in your office, let me know. I'll help you look for it. Um, but I encourage you all to use that as a resource of, hey, I'm thinking of hosting uh, you know, my first official visit. What do I do? Our policy is in there. Um, things about uh, tryouts again. Um, Really, any question you may have in regards to compliance, financial aid, certification, things of that, how we do things here at UIS is in that manual. So I encourage you to locate it and utilize it. Everything uh, that we do, you know, there's, there's lots of approvals and request forms. Um, they're all for a purpose, but all of those are located in box. So if you haven't already, make sure that you have access. You've been invited to a box folder. Allison and I share a forms folder that has everything you could possibly need for both business and compliance. Those approval forms I mentioned, the most frequent ones are list, uh, frequently utilized ones are listed here. And I just want to make mention to a couple uh, deadlines or um, how soon they'll have to be turned in. So OCRA is our acronym for the off-campus recruiting authorization. If you plan on recruiting off-campus, you submit an OCRA first to me and then to Allison um, at least 24 hours in advance. Camps and clinics, whether it's UIS or you're working an outside camp or clinic, please submit this at least 10 business days in advance. Official visits, uh, this is a paid visit, you must submit the request form with transcripts attached at least five business days in advance, and tryouts for uh, 48 hours or two business days. Um, community engagement or community service approval forms, five business days, um, and we can also utilize this um, for certain recruiting uh, interactions too. So we'll talk about that more later. Other forms, unofficial visits, occasional meal forms, grant and aid requests, this is how you would increase or lower someone's scholarship or, or do a new scholarship. Um, roster addition, deletion forms, voluntary termination of aid form, that's a, a scholarship actually, uh, athlete that quits the team, um, they're voluntarily giving up their scholarship. Recruiting logs, um, 
years ago when I first started, we used to have to keep weekly phone logs. We no longer have to do that. Division two rules change to where you only need to keep track of your date of first contact with a prospective student athlete. So how we do that here at UIS, we utilize the compliance assistance software, which is free software from the NCAA. I have the ability to create accounts for all of you. Then you'll log into that application or someone on your staff will be designated to log into that application and input all of your recruits and on their details page, the date and method that they were first contacted. So if it was by phone, email, in person, date of first contact. Practice logs are another uh, revolving submission. This is to be done weekly. We uh, run weeks from Sunday to Saturday. Uh, this is how we've established it at a department. Teams are not able to set their own weeks. And uh, we have two student athletes sign practice logs before they're submitted to my office. So you as coaches are responsible for having the student athletes come and sign the practice log probably on Mondays. Um, we prefer that it be a SAC rep because I do rules education with the SAC to let them know what they're signing off on. Um, so if you have SAC reps for your teams, I know we have some openings right now, um, that's who I would prefer. Otherwise, you know, just two uh, students who probably know what they're signing off on would be preferred. Um, these are submitted to the compliance office or my mailbox every Tuesday. This uh, template is also available on box. So just some important reminders that are uh, university compliance related, not necessarily NCAA, but we have what's called the protection of minors policy here at UIS where anyone who's involved with any minors in any capacity, uh, whether it be through UIS camps, um, maybe a 17-year-old senior coming on an, on, a, on an official visit, um, or when we have kids here for community engagement activities, SAC events, things of that nature, everyone involved with them must be background checked. This extends both staff and student athletes. So as a result, um, we end up background checking a lot of our student athletes. We used to have a great uh, reciprocal relationship with the Cox Center where they would background our, check our, our student athletes and we would then give them service hours. Unfortunately, that, that's been discontinued. So at this point, the only real solution we have is to run them through uh, the just HR background check, which costs around $35. Um, Allison has those forms. So if you do have student athletes, you plan on working your athletic camps, um, please you know, know that you're gonna be asked to background check them as soon as possible. And if you have any ideas for, for bringing minors to campus, um, especially official visit hosts, need to make sure that they're background checked as well. Um, one last reminder is FERPA. Um, we talked a lot about this with parents and, and uh, new students through orientation. Um, but really it's the um, Family Educational Rights Privacy Act um, and basically because student athletes are now enrolled in college and over the age of 18, we cannot discuss their academic record with their parents. This includes behavioral issues as well. So if you're having a, some discipline issues, the kid's not going to class, um, maybe they're not performing uh, you know, really well, in the classroom and, and you think letting mom or dad know might help, well unfortunately we're, we're not permitted to speak to parents on those issues unless the student athlete gives us express permission and the way we like to see that paint out is have the kid and the parent in the room or perhaps on speakerphone. Um, so if you do have to have any of those conversations that's how we navigate around that rule but just please be mindful that when you have parents calling inquiring about things, um, just lay FERPA on them so that they should be aware of what it is at this point. Okay, so um, Chancellor mentioned, you know, NCAA rules change every year and we did extensive kind of uh, conversation education about the proposals that were up for vote in January and what passed. Um, you know, one of those was getting a strength and conditioning coach, right? That was a new rule that uh, extended across Division Two was that 
Um, every institution either had to have a strength and conditioning coach for their program or every coach who ran strength and conditioning would have to be certified. So obviously that wasn't feasible. We got a strength and conditioning coach. So that's just an example of how NCAA rules can be awesome and work in our favor. So um, when you're griping about having the cement paperwork, just think in the back of your mind, said, hey, we've got a strength coach out of it. So other new rules. Um, you can now use, as a student athlete, you can use six credit hours of minor coursework um, towards that 24 hours of progress towards degree credit that they need. Used to be that minor coursework didn't apply to PD, PTD, which was really frustrating for a lot of kids, but now they can pursue minors as well and, and know that they're, all of that will hopefully count towards their 24 required each year. Um, a student athlete has to be both athletically and academically eligible to participate in any outside competition during the academic year, even as an unattached individual. So I know this is probably big for like swimming, cross country, and track. Um, so kids that maybe are, are partial qualifiers, non-qualifiers, are transfers who don't meet an exception, serving a year of residence, they would not be permitted to run unattached at any point during the school year any longer. Um, an institution can now provide up to five complimentary admissions to a recruit on an unofficial or official visit. This used to be three, they upped it. So um, if at any point you need five uh, complimentary admissions to a game for maybe a very large family that comes on a visit, you're now permitted to, to give up to five. <laughs> All right, so now we're just gonna kind of blow through each bylaw that um, Welcome. Thanks, sir. Um, so we're going to start with bylaw 10, good old bylaw 10, ethical conduct. Basically everything we do is, is centered around the pillars of honor seat and sportsmanship and ethical conduct is the foothold of that in, in far as NCAA uh, regulations go. So this is applicable to all prospective student athletes, student athletes, current and former institutional staff members. Um, if you refuse to furnish information relevant to an investigation of a possible violation, involvement in it, arranging any fraudulent academic credit or false transcripts, receipt of benefits or arranging meetings with agents, knowingly providing mm -hmm. student athletes with banned substances, or failure to provide complete and accurate information to the NCAA Eligibility Center admissions regarding a prospective student athlete's academic record. So these are the big no-nos that will get you slammed with a bylaw 10 violation, um, major infraction. Um, make sure that you understand these well. These are things that no institution ever wants to um, report. Also under bylaw 10 is the prohibition against wagering on sports. Um, so as you should all be aware, um, the following individuals or classes of individuals shall not knowingly participate in sports wagering activities or provide information to individuals involved or associated in any type of sports wagering acti activities concerning intercollegiate, amateur, or professional athletics competition. So, staff members of an institution's athletic department, everyone in this room, non-athletic department staff members who have responsibilities within or over athletics, so Marcel, Chancellor, uh, staff members of a conference office, and student athletes. So, because the NCAA sponsors football, we cannot bet on the outcome of the Super Bowl. We cannot enter fantasy leagues that we have to pay to enter for the chance of winning a prize on the back end. We cannot enter an NCAA bracket pool that requires $5 to buy a bracket. Um, we also cannot bet on the outcome of our own athletic contests and we cannot, as they said, furnish information to anyone who may be betting on the outcome of any athletic contest. Um, I give this spiel to our student athletes every year and this is probably the, the one rule that I get the most eye rolls about. And it's really, uh, you know, kind of disconcerting just because I always give them opportunities to still participate in these things. You can do it for free. You can enter the, the campus rec contest you can do a fantasy league that doesn't require a buy-in. We're just saying you can't put something of value up against you know, the chance of winning something else of value. So 
please help me enforce this, uh, you know, reinforce this rule and expectation with your student athletes, especially around heavy gambling times. Like I know fantasy football drafts just occurred or are occurring, um, and then of course March Madness in, in, in spring. Also, if you overhear friendly wagers going on on your, your sidelines or your benches, um, please, you know, remind them of, don't bet on it. Thank you. So, Bylaw 11 talks about personnel and the responsibility of the head coach. So, all of you assistants, you obviously know that you are reporting to your head coach, but what you may not know is that your head coach is also responsible in CAA rule-wise for everything you do. So, if you were to commit an NCAA violation, your head coach is going to be named in that report as well. So, if you didn't already have a, a, a kind of responsibility and accountability to them, please know that they're also responsible for you in, in this regard as well. So, as with that said, head coaches, the expectation is that you are enforcing and um, cultivating a culture of compliance within your individual programs and that you're making sure that your staff have the resources they need or know who to utilize as a resource. Also under Bylaw 11 is sports safety training. So each head coach and all other coaches who are employed full-time at an institution shall maintain current certification in first aid CPR and AED use. This is the bylaw. However, institutionally we require that all athletic staff who have anything to do with practice or game administration uh, would be certified in both first aid, CPR, AED. Jim had um, already reiterated that expectation in our staff meeting. Um, please make sure that you have recent certification prior to your first practice. Um, Katie has been sending emails to all of you who need to uh, re-up your certification. I'm included. Um, certification to recruit off campus. This is also something we've been talking about over the last week or so. Only coaches who have passed the NCAA recruiting test are certified to recruit off campus. Uh, the annual certification, so the 16-17 recruiting test, will expire on July 31st of 2017. New assistant coaches who wish to recruit must first complete compliance boot camp, which will be the second half of this presentation. Um, and volunteers, if you have any volunteers that you wish to have involved in recruiting, um, must first be cleared with your sports supervisor and, and possibly the AD, just because we want to make sure that um, if they are involved in recruiting that they have a close enough connection to the staff um, and rules education to make sure that they uh, they don't have a license to kill out there all right <clears throat> tobacco use um, again this is a rule that i talk about with all of our student athletes and again most of them roll their eyes but i understand on this one because there's really one sport that this this rule is, is preaching to and it's baseball, unfortunately, but all athletic staff and personnel are prohibited from using any tobacco product during uh, accountable athletically related activities. So this is practice and games, and this extends to all tobacco products, so chewable, snuffable, uh, smokable, all of the above. Um, also, UIS is a campus, is a smoke-free campus. Uh, this also extends to chewing tobacco, so no no use of tobacco in any university facilities. <laughs> All right, bylaw 12 is amateurism. Um, student athletes must maintain an amateur in their sport throughout their career as an NCAA student athlete. They'll lose their st status as an amateur and will not be eligible for intercollegiate athletics if, following their full-time enrollment in college, they sign a contract or commitment of any kind with an agent or they receive a benefit from an agent. Other impermissible activities following initial collegiate enrollment would be use of, a, of skill for pay or promise of pay, uh, signing a contract or receipt of benefits or competition on a professional team, and receipt of cash for participation, expenses based on finish, prize money, gift certificates, etc. Even if this were to be uh, allowable under the amateur rules of the national governing body of your sport, this would still be impermissible under NCAA rules. Promotional activities. A member institution conference or non-institutional uh, charity or nonprofit may use a student athlete's name, picture, or appearance. Appearance, I mean physically showing up to their event. 
um, to support its charitable or educational activities provided the following are met. They receive approval to participate from the president or designee. This is the chancellor. The chancellor will sign off on this annually. The activity does not involve co-sponsorship, advertisement, or promotion of commercial agencies. The student athlete does not miss class. All money derived from the activity goes directly to the member institution, charity, or conference office. The student athlete's picture is not used to promote any commercial ventures. Commercial items uh, with their name or picture are only able to be sold by a member institution, conference, or NCAA. And a student athlete or representative of the charitable, both parties, must sign off um, saying that the student athlete will appear or their likeness will be used in a manner consistent with these rules. So why am I talking about this? Because all of our uh, community service activities fall under this legislation. If we are sending our student athletes out to work at Habitat for Humanity, um, there's a chance that they may be you know, taking pictures of them, putting them up on the website, trying to use them to promote the, the mission of the institution or, or the organization. Um, we need to have them sign off on the front end that they understand that these certain rules apply to student athletes. So this is why we re require you to submit your service forms uh, on the front end so I can send a sign off to the organization to make sure we're meeting this legislation. So there's a, there's a, a method behind my madness, I promise. Um, this particularly applies to Paul's area. So when Paul is meeting with corporate sponsors and trying to figure out you know, ways that we can mutually fulfill um, kind of our goals, um, one example would be Shield, who's a great corporate sponsor of ours. Could be better, but good. Uh, <laughs> um, they have a VAT night uh, at a local uh, like hitting center, right? And they want to demo their bats and have the youth try out their bats. And they were looking for student athletes to come just throw balls at the event, not to hawk the bats necessarily, but to be involved in the promotion of the commercial venture of their you know, um, business. And Shields does not meet this nonprofit educational or charitable deal. So through this legislation, we were able to determine that student athletes wouldn't be able to participate, but coaches and staff could. So unfortunately, Paul got uh, conned out to pitching baseball for a few hours that night. He was hurting the next day. Um, but this is just an example of, of the application of this legislation. So let me know if you have any questions. One other area that this has come up with in recent years is when maybe Chipotle offers a 10% uh, kickback to a charity uh, on one night and we can hand out flyers like, hey, go to Chipotle and, and proceeds are going to come back to UIS to athletics. Student athletes would not be able to promote that evening. They would not be able to tweet, go out to Chipotle. They wouldn't be able to hand out flyers for us. They would be able to go and, and buy a burrito and discreetly be there. Um, but, you know, that, that's another example of um, a student athlete is promoting the commercial venture because the money is not going directly to the member institution. It's flowing through the commercial entity before we're getting it. So uh, more on that later. There, there's proposals to change it, but just so you are aware of that. <coughs> we'll, do that we'll do that again with Lake Point Girl this year. We'll do a scholarship night for us. So just try and remind your kids uh, so you can win whether and keep it. They do not put it on social media, so it makes it easier for us. Thank you. Student athlete employment. So student athletes can be employed in pretty much any capacity um, as long as they're paid only for work actually performed at a rate commensurate with the going rate in the locality for similar services. And the employer shall not use the athletics reputation of a student athlete employee to promote the sale of their product or services. <clears throat> All right, bylaw 13 recruiting. Just a few definitions to start you off with. A prospective student athlete, PSA, is a student who started classes for the ninth grade. Or if they've not started classes for the ninth grade, they've been provided financial aid to an individual or the individual's family. Uh, that's a little iffy, so just remember ninth grade. Um, a PSA is such until she enrolls full-time at a collegiate institution. 
and recruiting is solicitation of a prospective student athlete or their relatives by an institutional staff member for the purpose of securing their enrollment at your institution and ultimate participation in their athletics program. A recruited prospective student athlete is someone who's either come on an official visit, you've had an arranged in-person off-campus contact with them, you've initiated or arranged a telephone call on more than one occasion, or they've signed an MLI or scholarship agreement. So in order to use non-recruited student exceptions, for instance, they cannot have met any of these criteria. Contact. Contact is when you have face-to-face -face or pre-arranged encounter with a prospective student athlete, relative, uh, or legal guardians or themselves, during which any dialogue in excess of a casual greeting occurs. Telephone calls, text messages, or in-person, off-campus recruiting contacts shall not be made with a prospective student athlete or their relatives before June 15th preceding their junior year in high school. So June 15th between sophomore and junior year is when you're allowed to contact them for the first time. This includes email. You may not contact a PSA at their sporting event or on a day that they have a sporting event until they've been released from their coach at the end of the contest or tournament. If it's a multi-day tournament, this applies through the duration of the tournament. You cannot speak to them until the last day. However, you are now permitted to speak to their families during the contest. You may have unlimited contacts with prospective student athletes. <clears throat> Visits to a prospective student athlete's educational institution during the school day when classes are in session requires prior approval from the principal or uh, executive officer at that school. You shall not make any contact on campus, off campus, email, telephone, with a prospective student athlete from an NCAA or NAIA four-year institution without first obtaining permission to contact. I can't stress this one enough because this is probably one of the most frequently violated rules around here anyways. Um, you do not reply to an email call back you know, a kid on the phone, or even welcome a, a walk up in your office um, until you find out if they're coming from a four-year institution. And if they are, you say, I'm sorry, I can't speak with you until I receive permission to contact. I am happy to send the request for permission to contact for you, so just let me know. If you get an email from a kid, <clears throat> forward to me before you even reply to them, I'm happy to do that. Also, if they attach a release letter or a permission to contact letter to that email, forward it to me as well. Um, first of all, it has to be on file in my office, but second of all, I'm going to take a look at that and make sure it's not fake. Funny enough, I've found fake ones. They, they're pretty apparent that they're fake. I've emailed clients to ask if it's legit, and they're like, nope, no, I didn't. <laughs> That's not my signature. So. Um, best practice and, and for the safety of your, your uh, you know, what you're trying to do, please run things by me um, and I will let you know when you're good to contact them. Evaluations, any off-campus activity designed to assess the academic or athletic ability of a PSA. Uh, institution may evaluate a PSA at any time during uh, contact and evaluation periods. There's no number or limitation on the number of evaluations you can have, and uh, you may evaluate a PSA at any time. Obviously, if you're going to a, a soccer game, you can't only watch the juniors and seniors, so uh, you're able to evaluate PSAs at any point. <clears throat> An unofficial visit can be made uh, at any point, again, during their high school career. Um, ninth graders, if, if they want to come on an unofficial visit uh, and they're coordinating it through admissions, you're able to meet with them. That's within the rules. Um, you may provide transportation for a PSA on an unofficial visit only to view off-campus practice competition institutional facilities, and you may also uh, drive them to attend an off-campus meal now. Um, <clears throat> An institutional staff member must accompany the PSA on the trip. Obviously, you can't give them the, car to the keys to the recruiting car. Um, and during an unofficial visit, as I said, you can provide one meal either on campus or off campus within the locale of the institution. 
an official visit or a paid visit is available for a student athlete uh, again June 15th preceding junior year of high school. Um, an institution must be presented with the following prior to their arrival on campus and they, we must be presented to this remember five business days before the visit for compliance approval. Um, <clears throat> an ACT or SAT score if they've taken it uh, most recent transcript and they must be registered with the eligibility center. An official visit may not exceed 48 hours <clears throat> and you may provide them with a maximum of $30 entertainment funds um, to a student host. Um, that's $15 for the host, $15 for the PSA per day. If a host is hosting two PSAs, you can up it to 45. This does not include the cost of meals. This is for things such as going to the movies, bowling, uh, etc. Um, student athletes serving as student hosts may also receive meals alongside a, a prospective student athlete on an official visit. So please remember, yes. Has to be the host? For, for instance, you yes. bring a kid in, and the, but what if the host has class at 9 to Then 11? you could do an occasional meal with the other student athlete, but per the legislation, only the student host is permitted. Okay. <clears throat> Um, only one student may be provided that free meal with the, student, the <coughs> recruit, um, but as I said, we can use the occasional meal legislation if you wanted to have the whole team meet with the, the recruit, perhaps in the dining hall or something like that. So, um, just an example, if you have a creative idea, I'm happy to be flexible and try to make it work. Complementary admissions, as we discussed, they've upped it to five this year. Tryouts. Tryouts are unique to Division II. Um, you are able to provide a tryout to a prospective student athlete, again, June 15th, preceding junior year in high school is when you can start. The tryout must be held outside of the traditional season of their sport. The traditional season of their sport is defined by the first team practice and the last team game or practice. So, if it's a basketball player, basketball, practice has not started yet at the high school level, I'm assuming, they could have a tryout right now. Um, women's soccer is a spring sport in Illinois. They can have tryouts right now. Men's soccer, fall sport, could not. Um, before they can be come on a tryout, they have to present a medical exam or physical that was dated within the last six months. If it was not dated within the last six months, there is an exception. It could be dated within six months of their season of that year, so as we get later into the school year, if they uh, had one within six months of season, that works as well. Um, you provide the <clears throat> uh, physical and the request form to me two days in advance of the tryout for approval. I'll take it down to athletic training and they'll sign off on whether or not the, the physical is sufficient to meet the legislation and also if there's any health concerns that we should be aware of when they're um, participating. They also have to either provide sickle cell results or sign a sickle cell waiver. Um, I prefer that you submit that sickle cell waiver already signed at the time you're submitting that tryout request as well. <clears throat> Tryouts uh, have to be limited to no longer than two hours. Um, they can only have one. so one tryout per institution as a PSA. Uh, clothing and equipment can be provided on an issuance and retrieval basis, and competition against your team is permissible as long as uh, such uh, competition is permissible under your team's playing practices and rules. And it has to be considered team activity or skill instruction if you're out of season. <clears throat> Publicity. It's impermissible to publicize a prospective student athlete's visit to our campus. This includes social media postings, pictures, electronic message boards on campus, and even paper signs announcing their visit. So, um, another scenario that this might occur is camps and clinics. A prospective student athlete is defined, as I said earlier, as someone who started classes for the ninth grade. It didn't say anywhere in there that it's a realistic prospect for your program, that they even necessarily play your sport. So, if you have kids coming who meet that PSA definition for camps and clinics, you cannot publicize their attendance on our campus either. This is face shots um, of camps. 
or uh, giving media access to your student athletes, maybe to do um, a quick news report on the high school prospect camp going on at UIS. We can't give David Coy access to our student athletes for, or the prospective student athletes for a quick uh, snippet. So just keep publicity in mind. Yes. Haley, what's the rule again? Like if coaches have kids coming for an official visit, they're staying at one of our partner hotels. What's the rule on leaving anything in their room? Or if it's room? private, that's fine. <laughs> um, so you can't have it sitting on the lobby when they walk into the room? No. Not unless they do that for all new guests. I have one quick question. Yes. Just going back to slides. Um, as far as the five maximum for um, the, the complimentary admission, is that per concept? Mm -hmm. It's per concept. Yeah. So, for instance, I'll have two. If I have a recruiting for a weekend on a visit, then I have a Friday night and a Saturday morning. Yes, they'll have five, five admissions okay. each day. Perfect. Thanks. All right. So, just some social media do's and don'ts. Uh, I just wanted to go over. I know that there's been some changes in Division One as to what they can do regarding social media and following and liking and things like that. That only happened for Division One. So I just wanted to be clear and remind everyone of what we can and can't do at the Division Two level. So following June 15th, preceding their junior year of high school, you may follow or friend a prospective student athlete on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, etc. Um, you may send a private message or direct message uh, via Messenger or Twitter or Instagram. You may make generic congratulatory posts about an entire team. Um, for instance, congratulations to Sacred Heart Griffins men's basketball team. But you may not uh, post um, about any specific student athletes. If you're out recruiting, you could also say, hey, great night recruiting out at such and such and a picture of the field. That's fine, as long as no student athletes are identifiable in that picture. What you cannot do is you cannot tweet at, comment on, retweet, like, or favorite, uh, or write on someone's Facebook wall of a prospective student athlete. Don't post any photos of a prospective student athlete, regardless of the location or the context of the photo. So pretty much don't have any public interaction with a prospective student athlete on Twitter or Facebook. It can appear that you're friends and that you follow one another, but nobody else should be able to see any interaction between you two on any pages. So if you have any questions, please let me know. All right, eligibility. I'm just going to go through this kind of quickly. Um, this is my bread and butter, not necessarily yours, but uh, it's helpful for you to know as you know, we're trying to get our student athletes um, eligible every semester, and certainly it's applicable when we get to transfers. So initial eligibility, um, high school requirements. Currently, they must graduate from high school, complete a minimum of 16 core courses, and have a 2.0 GPA in those 16 core courses. And they must present either a 68-sum ACT, which is roughly a 17 or 18, and a 820 SAT. Um, they must register with the NCAA Eligibility Center at some point, but we recommend that they do it before their junior year in high school. And they must be certified by the Eligibility Center no later than 45 calendar days after the first practice or opening day of classes, whichever occurs first. If after that time the student athlete is not certified, they have to be pulled from practice until they've achieved both academic and amateurism certification if they're a freshman, and if they're a transfer, it's that amateurism certification. Organized competition legislation. This is stating that a student athlete has one grace year from the time that they graduate high school to enroll in college. So it's that year where they can go work, they can go abroad, they can try their uh, amateur baseball dreams, you know, whatever they want. Um, but they have one year from the time they graduate high school to do that. After that one year has elapsed, Anything that they do athletically that's considered organized competition, which meets those criteria, will count as a season of competition against them. And it will also require that they serve a year of residence before being eligible at any NCAA institution. So when you're recruiting kids with an untraditional timeline, keep in mind this organized competition legislation. 
progress towards degree requirements, a student athlete must maintain progress towards a degree in being in academic good standing. Uh, they are now required to complete nine credit hours during the previous full-time semester and 24 credit hours since the beginning of the previous fall term or previous two full-time terms if we're doing a mid-year. Um, average of 12 credit hours per semester of collegiate enrollment. Student athlete entering their fifth semester or third year of enrollment must declare a major. Courses used to certify progress towards degree thereafter must be certified as degree applicable. And the institutional GPA good standing requirement is a 2.0. So it's pretty cut and dry. 2.0 GPA is required. Transfer eligibility. Um, a student who transfers, let's just set the baseline rule. If someone transfers, they're required to meet, serve a year of residence unless they meet an exception. So, two-year transfer eligibility exception is <clears throat> if they transfer in either an average of 12 credit hours or uh, earn an associate's degree, and they have a GPA of a 2.2 now with earning six credits of English, three of math, and three of science, or they earn an associate's degree, they will likely be eligible for competition. Four-year transfers are a little different. Um, <clears throat> partial or non-qualifiers will have had a uh, residency requirement at the previous institution. Qualifiers, not so much. But there's exceptions that four-year transfers meet. This is either the discontinued non-sponsored sport exception, two-year non-participation exception, non-recruited exception that I mentioned earlier, or the frequ most frequently used one-time transfer exception. One-time transfer exception is that a student athlete is not previously transferred from a four-year. They're in good standing and meet progress degree requirements at the previous institution. They would have been eligible had they remained there, and that the school signs off in writing that they have no objection to us using this exception. Financial aid. We're very fortunate here, as I've said many times, that we have Carolyn as our financial aid liaison. She keeps an eye on all of this for us. Um, so I'm just going to give you kind of the, the quick and dirty on financial aid. A counter is someone that receives athletically aid, financial aid based on athletics. Um, and they, their athletic aid will then count towards your maximum equivalencies for your sport. An institution may not award a student athlete financial aid in excess of their full grant and aid amount, which is their tuition fees, housing, meals, and books. Um, and to be eligible to represent an institution in competition, a student athlete has to be included on the squad list, which used to be a financial aid form, so that's why that's in there. Financial aid based in any degree on athletics ability may not be de increased, decreased, or canceled during the period of the award unless they render themselves ineligible or get removed from the team. Renewal and non-renewal notifications of institutional athletics aid must be made before July 1st. We try to do this in uh, April every year before the kids leave. Notification of renewals and non-renewals cannot come from our office. It has to come from the financial aid office. But you do have to notify a kid verbally if you are going to be reducing their award for the next year. So as a result, once you have notified a kid that their money is going to be decreased, we have 14 days before our, where Carolyn has to notify them in writing. So that's why it's very important we're in constant communication about those things. Um, if you're notifying a kid that their scholarship is going to be reduced, we ask that I'm present for that meeting so there's just a third party in there. If I'm not available, sports supervisor, or even assistant coach if necessary. That reduction or non-renewal form must be submitted in seven days so I can have Carolyn send them a letter within 14 days. Bylaw 16 is awards and benefits. An extra benefit is any special arrangement by an institution employee or booster that provides a student athlete or the relative or friends with a benefit that's not generally made available to the entire student body. Institution may provide things like travel expenses for participation in athletics competition, um, apparel, 
things of that nature. Uh, we can also pay for some strange things like the cost of a telephone, copying fax, or using the internet while we're traveling on the road. Uh, we could not use them on our campus, however. Um, and student athletes or an entire team may receive an occasional meal in the locale of an institution from either a staff member or booster on an occasional basis. Institutionally, I've just defined occasional as no more than one a month or averaging out to one a month. Student athletes uh, may receive occasional meals from uh, representatives of athletics interest, but it must be a home meal. And they may receive meals from parents. So if you have parents that want to contribute free meals to your program, that can be done at any location. Student athletes may not accept free of charge or purchase the discounted or reduced rates, athletics equipment, supplies, or clothing that's not offered to the general student body. Such items may be provided to student athletes on an issuance and retrieval basis only. And we can provide four complimentary admissions to student athletes per their uh, per home or away contest, regardless of if the student athlete competes in that contest or not. There was an interpretation that came out this spring that said it is okay if your student athlete does not use all of their passes to let a teammate then use theirs. So it just has to come out to an average of no more than four complimentary admissions per student athlete. Playing in practice season. Okay, I do have a handout for this. If all head coaches could take, or all coaching staff and athletic trainers will do that. So admin, no need to worry. One of each. All right, so playing in practice season. Countable athletically related activity is any activity with an athletic purpose involving student athletes that is either at the direction of, supervised by, or required by any member of an institution's coaching staff. And all of that countable activity must be counted within your daily and weekly numbers of activity. <clears throat> during the season, all countable athletically related activities shall be prohibited during one day per week. So this one day off that they have, there can be no interaction with any coaching staff on their one day off in terms of athletics. You cannot give them voluntary skill instruction. You cannot require them to hold a captain's practice. You cannot require them to do something and then post it on social media or something else that you could monitor. Their one day off must be a true day off with no coaching or supervision from you. <clears throat> Student athletes can participate in a max of four hours of countable athletically related activity a day, 20 hours a week, and the hours must be recorded on that practice log we talked about earlier. Student athletes are prohibited from using tobacco during countable athletically related activity. Please help me remind them of this. And no class time is allowed to be missed for practice activities, except when the practice is associated with an away from home uh, competition. Um, so. If your kid has a class conflict with practice, they have to go to class. That's the, the meat of it. I've explained this to the student athletes that you guys are all gonna be open and willing to accommodate this, so please don't make me a liar. If they have class, they have to go. If they skip it, it's an NCAA violation. We have to report it. Playing and practice seasons. At the end of your playing and practice season, so your last competition of your championship season, you have to have a 14-day cooling off period. So 14 days where you have no contact with your student athletes other than end of season meetings or check in on academic matters. When you're outside of your season, so when we start Thursday, majority of you will be out of season, you'll be limited to eight hours a week and no more than two of which can be team activities or skill instruction. So the way I really kind of break that down is no more than two with your team equipment. So basketball, no basketball for more than two hours. Um, the other six is strength and conditioning. 
So I handed out that countable and non-countable chart for you and just the quick and dirty because I re reported three playing and practices and violations in the last calendar year. So please use this as a reference to know what is countable and what's not countable. Pick up with your teams as countable, observing uh, just arm exercises on your day off is countable. Um, a kid comes to you and says, hey coach, I need help with my, my swing, that's countable. So please, please know uh, that this is something that I am educating your student athletes on so that they know what they're signing off on on those practice logs. Um, so please make yourself as, as informed as possible and let me know if you have any questions about this area. Finally, enforcement, so secondary violations are violations that are isolated or inadvertent in nature and, per, and it's not per, intended to provide a uh, recruiting or competitive advantage. And multiple secondary violations by a member institution may be collectively considered a major violation and all athletic staff and individuals with athletics oversight are required to self-report any known violations. So one more item on secondary violations, as Chancellor mentioned, that something that you know self-reporting is best. Um, the NCAA will look a lot more kindly on a self-report that says, how was this violation discovered? Coach self-reported it. Um, certainly, mistakes happen, we're all human, and it's healthy to self-report violations because it shows that we're monitoring and that we care about rule compliance. So on any given year, I am reporting five to 15 violations. So it's not the end of the world. Please know that it's gonna be a whole lot worse if I find out about it some other way than you walking into my office and just owning up to, to making a mistake. We're all human and it's, it's okay. So closing remarks. Um, I'm a resource, not a cop for the NCAA. Please use me as such. Um, I'll go above and beyond to try to find a way to say yes to your requests. I'll try to use the legislation creatively. I'll ask for interpretations from the NCAA or conference office because my end goal is to be able to say yes to you. But please respect if I have to say no, it's because it's truly impermissible and I have gone the extra mile to make sure. There's no dumb questions, only dumb people who don't ask questions. So please don't feel like you're asking something stupid. Um, I'd much rather feel the caller question at 10 p.m. on a Tuesday or 8 a.m. on a Saturday than file a self-report. So uh, ask before you act, don't bet on it, insert other compliance cliche phrase, and the, my pet peeve, so don't even say it to me, is just because someone else is doing it doesn't make it le legal, okay? So because so-and-so is doing it at Maryville or UMSL or any other school doesn't mean that it's within the rules, okay?